Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of All For You. This will be Part 20, Day 38. Izuku was getting worse rapidly. His blood tests were abnormal, and his little belly was swelling up, and it must hurt. Even with all the powerful painkillers he was already on, if he was touched, all he did was cry and cry and cry, until he was too tired to cry anymore, which was happening quicker and quicker. Hizashi had never been in this much agony in his life. If he could take this away from Izuku, take it away and deal with it himself, he would in a fraction of a heartbeat. He was stronger. He had many, almost too many quirks to help deal with injuries, with illness, with pain. His body and its systems were mature. He was far more equipped to handle serious illness and partial organ death than an infant that, by all rights, should not have even been born yet. There had to be a quirk for that, right? A quirk that could take on injuries or illnesses at the expense of the user. It sounded like a miserable quirk, no one in the right mind would want, like the kind of quirk someone would beg him to take away, yet right now, Hisashi wanted that quirk more than anything. But he couldn't go get it. Custody agreement be damned, it meant nothing if Izuku didn't live, after all. He couldn't bring himself to leave. He couldn't, wouldn't, leave, not when there was the very, very real chance that every breath Izuku took could be his last. He couldn't even bring himself to look away long enough to dial Inko's number. All his time was spent watching Izuku's chest rise and fall, counting his heartbeats. He wasn't sleeping again. Nor was he eating. Not even the protein bars. It felt like the rot in Izuku had infected him, too. The mere thought of food made him dangerously nauseous. He'd caught Sonoki-san glaring at him and noticed the nurses gently urging him to go to bed, but... He'd get eight hours a night, to the minute every day for the rest of his life if he could just make sure Izuku made it through this. There was a chance. Not a very good one. Not a very good one at all. But there was one. He'd cling to it with everything he had. He could sleep when his son wasn't dying. He wasn't getting better. All the Izuku's energy seemed to be spent on simply breathing, his chest moving visibly with each gasp, despite the machine helping him. His test continued to be abnormal. His belly kept swelling. There had to be something he could do. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, this is Inko Midoriya. I'm sorry I missed your call. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Beep. Inko, I... A shaky gasp. I don't know what to do. Call ended. It was just like a hand hug. Just a regular hand hug, and Izuku would never know the difference. He'd just get better, the rot would go away, and Izuku would go back to doing well. Everything would be fine. Everything would be fine. Everything would be fine. Hizashi swallowed. Hard. Izuku squirmed under his hands, arms flailing, tiny feet pushing against his palm. Normally, when he gave someone a quirk, their forehead lay flat against his hand. Izuku was too small for that. His entire head fit into his hand, with room to spare. He'd picked the weakest healing quirk he had. It was one he'd taken many years ago, in the early years of quirks, and it had later been supplemented by more powerful healing quirks taken from subsequent generations. In all honesty, he'd half forgotten about it, but now... Well, now it might be the most precious quirk of them all. It caused the user to heal faster when they were asleep, though with the trade-off of making them sleep more. Most of what Izuku did was sleep anyway, so it should be fine. Giving a family member a weak quirk had backfired horribly last time, but he didn't know what else to do. Izuku whined miserably. Izashi flinched, but didn't pull his hands away. He hadn't even done anything yet. Maybe this was a bad idea. Not for the same reason as giving Yoichi a quirk was a bad idea. The NEC might... Not be his fault, but if he went through with this, and it ended badly, that would be. Would it hurt him? Would it ki- An alarm went off. Hizashi pulled his hands away like they had caught fire. He stared at Izuku. His chest moved up and down visibly with each breath, like he was fighting for it. His face was scrunched up like he was about to cry. He let out a weak whimper. Izashi's heart hurt. He didn't want Izuku to cry. He just wanted him to get better. He wanted to see him smile, hear him laugh. He tore his eyes away and stared at the monitors. He watched Izuku's vitals with aching heart in his throat. 
The alarm that had gone off wasn't even one of Izuku's. He wasn't alarming, but he'd been close. Very close. He can't do it. He can't do it. He can't do it. There had to be something he could do. He couldn't handle just sitting around waiting for Izuku to die. Hezashi walked out of Izuku's room, looking for Sanagi-san. There, she was standing at the nurse's station, looking at patient files. Sanagi-san, he called, walking up to her. I had an idea to help Izuku if possible, but I didn't want to do anything without doctor's advice. I... I have several healing quirks. I could give one to Izuku. Would that... Uh, could I... Izashi trailed off, watching her. Sanaki-san slowly closed the file folder. She had been looking at and turned to look at him with a suspicious look in her eyes. He tugged on the sleeves of his jacket and wrung his hands. He could feel the eyes of other parents in the NICU looking at him through the windows of their own rooms as if he was some kind of spectacle or zoo animal. It was an old feeling. He knew why they were staring. He didn't talk to the other parents, which was not the norm. While they seemed to find comfort in each other, he preferred to stay in Izuku's room. He was unfamiliar, and he was odd, which naturally caught other people's attention. Normally, that feeling didn't bother him. Normally, he didn't particularly care what civilians thought about him unless they could play a role in his plans. But he was one of them now, and he was currently doing an exceptionally poor job. Somehow, he had the feeling that they could tell that just by looking at him. He felt exposed, inadequate, and painfully alone. He missed Inko. He missed his brother. He just wanted someone else here with him. Did you have one in mind? You said you had several, Sanaki-san said. Hezashi nodded. She stared at him expectantly and motioned for him to continue. Right, of course, Hezashi said. The one I had in mind is a sleep-based healing quirk. It draws energy from the user while they are asleep and to heal injuries and fight illnesses at an accelerated rate. It tends to make the user sleepier, but that is really the only drawback. I have other healing quirks, but I think they require more energy than Izuku has. He had felt his heart beginning to settle while he spoke about the quirk, but it was a temporary relief. The quirk was not complicated, but the expression on Sanaki-san's face was not an encouraging one. He tugged on his jacket sleeves mercilessly. Well... Sanaki-san said. I don't know anything about the quirk transfer process. How does it work for other people that you've given quirks to? Izashi's fingers found a loose thread in the sleeve of his jacket. He pulled on it and started to wind it around his fingers. He felt pathetic. It requires me to put my hand on the other person. He started. No, Sanaki-san interrupted. I should have been more specific. How does it usually affect the person getting a quirk? Oh, Izashi said. It can depend on the quirk, but usually it goes well. Sometimes it can go poorly. It usually goes well with children, though. Sanaki-san eyed him. Izashi tugged harder on the loose thread he'd found. Poorly how? she asked critically. Vegetative state, he mumbled quickly. Her eyebrows shot up. But I've never seen that happen in children, and it usually only occurs in people that receive multiple quirks. Sanaki-san let out a sigh, pinching the bridge of her nose. "'Sometimes I forget your S-tier,' she mumbled under her breath. "'What's the age of the youngest person you've given a quirk to?' "'Age four, Hizashi said softly. He'd taken quirks from younger individuals, but he'd never given one before the age where a quirk should show up. What was the point, when the individual might develop their own better quirk at a later date? Of course, the thought of what would happen if an individual developed a quirk after he had already given them one— eventually led to the Nomu experiments, and no, he was not thinking about that right now. "'Okay,' Sanaki-san said, rubbing her temples one last time before crossing her arms and looking him in the eyes. First of all, what you're suggesting would essentially be an experimental treatment, especially since you've never done it before. We have no real idea what could happen.' But, Izashi protested, "'Second, at age four to five, the body is prepared for a quirk.' Sanaki-san said. The only premature infants that have a quirk are those born with them. Izuku was not born with a quirk. He probably couldn't handle it. I don't think it's a good idea. But this could save his life. It could also end it. Hizashi's jaw shut with a click. Sanaki-san continued. My concern is that it might present as something similar to quirk overuse in young children that could be minor fatigue, 
muscle spasms, brain fog, lapses in consciousness, all of which could be highly dangerous for a premature infant. It could also be worse. Brain bleeds, seizures, organ failure, stroke, death. I don't think that it's worth the risk. Brain bleeds, seizures, organ failure, stroke, death. He, he almost, don't think about it. Just get back to the room. All right. Thank you, doctor. Izashi said faintly, turned around, and walked as steadily as he could back to Izuku's room. The door closed behind him quietly, and Izashi pressed his hand to his mouth, leaning against the door. His stomach convulsed as his eyes automatically drifted to his son's incubator, so he closed them. Don't think about it. He almost. He nearly. Don't think about it. He wanted to vomit. How close had he been? How close had Izuku been? Don't think about it. But how could he not? How could he not? He almost killed his son. How close had he been? Minutes? Seconds? How long would it have taken? How much would he have suffered? How would it feel to have his infant son's blood on his hands? Hizashi forced his eyes open. Izuku's incubator sat in the middle of the room. His baby was silent. Too silent. He pushed himself away from the door, forcing his feet to carry him to Izuku's side. He needed to check. Nothing happened, right? He'd... He'd never given a quirk accidentally. Izashi looked down. Izuku's chest rose and fell steadily. He was breathing a little hard, and he hadn't moved since Izashi had left to ask that horrid question. He was asleep. Izashi looked up. Nothing had changed on the monitors. Izuku was fine. As fine as he could be, which was not very fine at all. He felt frozen in place. He wanted to sit next to Izuku, talk to him, or sing to him or hum for him, like he normally did. But how could he? How could he possibly dare to sit next to Izuku when he... when he had almost... Inka would be horrified. His brother would have expected this. His phone felt like a weight in his pocket. The hand still clamped to his mouth was the only thing keeping him in one piece. He staggered backwards, away from his delicate baby, far away so that he couldn't hurt him. His legs bumped into the couch by the window, and he let himself fall into it. He hunched over, closed his eyes, and let his other hand tug viciously on his hair. If he had questioned whether he was unfit to parent Izuku before, he knew with certainty now. How had he ever thought he could do this? Ego and overconfidence, probably. But he should have known. He was nothing like Inko, nothing like Yoichi. He had killed any softness or kindness or love in himself a long time ago in pursuit of power. He was just grasping at the ghosts of memories now, trying and failing to force his rotten heart and to a pale imitation of what he thought love was supposed to be. He could never compare to the real thing. All he knew was how to kill, how to cause pain, how to use people. How could he ever think he was capable of this, of love? He had spent his entire abnormally long life mocking it, and now he thought he could master it in less than a month. He was a spectacularly large idiot. As you could deserve to know true love, love that Izashi, that all for one, was incapable of giving. If he knew what was good for Izuku, he would just hand his baby over to the Bakugos, or All Might even. They would do a better job than he would. They wouldn't almost kill their baby when they were just trying to help. He should just give up. Go back to villainy. Go back to trying to live forever. It was what everyone expected of him anyway. But what was the point? Living forever, playing games for eternity, once a glorious ideal vision for the future was now just cheap plastic sprayed in gold paint. An empty goal with no purpose. A poor band-aid, for the gaping wound leaving Izuku behind, would open. It would never stick. He couldn't even kid himself into wanting it anymore. Not when remaking the world to his ideal would make it impossible for Izuku to thrive, or even survive. No matter what he did, he would always come back to trying to be with Izuku, even if it wasn't good for either of them. Maybe if he went to Tartarus, Izuku would be able to visit. The door opened. Hizashi didn't look up. Footsteps tapped against the floor, confident and purposeful. Sonaki-san. He felt like he wanted to sink into the floor. He stayed where he was and hoped pathetically that she was just here to check on Izuku and would ignore his sorry state. Of course, he didn't get so lucky. After a while, the footsteps started towards him. The couch dipped as Sonaki-san sat next to him. Hizashi didn't move. She sat in silence for a while. Did you give him anything? No, he whispered. 
Then what are you doing over here? Sonaki-san asked. I... almost... Yes, Sonaki-san interrupted. Almost. You didn't do anything. You went to a doctor and did what the doctor said. Izuku is fine. You did nothing wrong. Hisashi wanted to scream. He had been seconds away from killing his baby. There was no way he had done nothing wrong. And Izuku was very, very far from fine. He was dying. He kept his mouth shut, though. Sonaki-san sighed. You know, he was a bit fussier than usual when I checked on him just now. He doesn't like my hugs as much as he likes yours. Hizashi doubted that. You may not be able to give him a cork that'll fix everything, Midoriya-san. But you can still be there for him. You're still dad, she said. She stood up, patting his shoulder gruffly. Be brave, Midoriya-san, she said as she left. The door closed quietly behind her. He was being brave, so he was staying away. It was the best possible thing he could do for Izuku. He still didn't have the strength to leave the room, though. Time passed. The light faded from the sky. Several nurses came and went, and Izashi never moved. Izuku cried at one point. Izashi's entire body twitched with the urge to go over to him, calm him down. But he couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't. The nurse managed to quiet him. Izashi knew that he should take it as a sign that Izuku would be okay without him, but all he did was open up a gaping, bleeding hole in his chest. He still didn't have the strength to leave. He didn't know how long it was until someone bothered him again. The door opened quietly, familiar voices whispering amongst themselves. Izashi didn't move. A small item fell into his lap. He blinked, slowly looking down and picking it up. It was a little lamb, holding onto an attached blanket. It was incredibly soft. He rubbed the little lamb's ears between his two fingers. He wanted to give it to Izuku. His eyes stung. What are you doing sitting over here? Masaru asked softly, from his other side. He hadn't noticed him sitting down next to him. You look like a sad sack of potatoes, Mitsuki snarked, from where she was looking at Izuku. Good. That was good. That meant she cared about him. He looked back down at the lamb blanket. He knew they did. He just... needed to... I can't do this, Hisashi whispered. He never should have thought he could. He was a supervillain, a murderer, a monster, not... He wasn't Inko. He'd spent his entire life working towards being a supervillain and never once thought he would regret it. Now he did. Hmm? Masaru prompted. What are you talking about? Mitsuki asked. Hisashi said nothing, shifting his grip on the little lamb. It was holding the blanket in its arms, a small smile stitched onto its soft face. The words stuck in his throat, but he could not swallow them. He needed to speak. I... Something terrible almost happened, because of... of me, and due to that, it has made me realize that Izuku... He cleared his throat. Izuku may be better off in... in someone else's care. Your care, specifically. Nobody said anything for a long moment. That's stupid, Mitsuki said. Hisashi, he's fine. Nothing happened. Why the fuck would you punish yourself over something that almost happened? It implies that it is not safe for him to be with me. That I am not a fit parent, Hisashi said softly. Each word felt like the twist of a knife in his gut, but it had to be done. He wanted Izuku to have a life worth living, and if he could not give it, then he would give Izuku to someone who could give him that. Hisashi... Masaru asked. Can I ask what happened? He didn't want to breathe a word of what he had almost done. The shame, the guilt of it alone, already threatened to crush him. Admitting it aloud might as well be torture. But if Izuku needed him to, then... Izuku is... very ill right now. His treatment hasn't really been going as hoped, so... Izashi fiddled with the lamb's ears again. It was better than wringing his hands... I had an idea. I have multiple quirks. Amongst them are quirks that can aid in healing. I wanted to give him one. I almost did. Okay, while I think that using your quirk to try and fix everything is a bad idea, I don't see where something terrible almost happened here, Mitsuki said. Masaru hummed in agreement. I was probably seconds away from giving him one before I decided that I should check with the doctor. Izashi swallowed hard. They said it probably would have killed him if I had gone through with it. Silence hung for a moment. 
Then it's a good fucking thing you didn't, isn't it? Mizuki said. To me, Masaru said softly. It sounds like you were just trying to help. I was, Izashi admitted. But that doesn't change the fact that he could have died because of me. I can't... Can't do this when he almost experimented on his child, like he was afraid of Garaki doing. Can't do this when he almost murdered his child, one of many, many victims. Can't do this when he was so far from proper parental material. He might as well be the opposite. I just need to renegotiate some things, set up a few trusts and liquidate some assets, to make sure that you and Izuka will be well provided for. But I'm sure that will go smoothly now that I will be going quietly to Tartarus. Hizashi, Mitsuki said, her voice low and serious. He looked up to find her eyes blazing. What the fuck are you talking about? She demanded. Hizashi blinked slowly. It is the best decision I can make to keep Izuku safe, he said. You think the best decision you can make is to waltz away and become a deadbeat? Mitsuki snapped. I trust you two to take good care of him, Izashi said. And you would promise to take him in should things go wrong. Yeah, with negotiations, Mitsuki said. Not you giving up. Mitsuki, Izashi said. I am a dangerous man. I am a bad person. My hands are covered in blood, adults and children alike. I deserve Tartarus. You should take Izuku and Katsuki far away from me before I... Before I do something none of us will like. Mitsuki hissed and stood up. Izashi looked up at her, preparing to speak again, until his head snapped to the left. The sound of Mitsuki's slap rang in the silence of the room. His cheek stung. He probably should have expected that. How dare you, Mitsuki seethed. How dare you use my baby as some sort of tool in your fucked up little pity party to try and manipulate us? I am not trying to manipulate you, Izashi lied, speaking slowly. I'm just trying to get you to see reason. Reason my ass, Mitsuki hissed. You're just trying to run away. I am not, Izashi snapped. I am trying to keep him safe. I am trying to do what's right for once in my life. You're not doing the right thing. You're doing the easy thing, Mitsuki snapped back. Izashi shut his mouth. You feel bad for almost fucking up. You feel guilty because you were a fucking monster. But instead of fucking facing it or making it better, you just decide to run away. It's a lot fucking easier to sit and time out till you croak than it is to learn what you did wrong and fucking fix it. You're a fucked up person, Hizashi, a really fucked up person, but you're not completely irredeemable, Mitsuki said, her voice shaking. Whether it was from anger or some other emotion, Hizashi could not tell. Giving up your own damn kid, because you can't stop throwing a tantrum long enough to put your fucking ego away for five minutes, would push you over that edge, because guess what? This isn't about you anymore. Maybe for the first time in your stupidly long life, it isn't fucking about you. It's about Izuku, and right now, he needs his fucking father. Hizashi let his head hang. Grow the hell up, Hizashi, Mitsuki said, her voice still wobbling. Then she walked away. The creak of plastic vinyl signified that she had sat in his, no, the chair next to Izuku. Hizashi rubbed the little lamb's ears again. Hizashi? Masaru asked. Hizashi said nothing. Before Inko, did you have anyone else? Why? Just humor me, Masaru said softly. Hizashi closed his eyes. My brother, well over a century ago. He never felt the weight of those years more than he did now. No one else? No. Masaru hummed, shifting next to him. What do you think your brother would have wanted you to do in this situation? Hizashi hummed an unamused laugh. I think you would have been more horrified with the fact that someone was intimate with me. Hizashi chuffed a small laugh. Hizashi, come on, you know what I meant. Hizashi sighed. I think he would rather me dead, honestly. Masaru said nothing for a moment. Rocky relationship? That's one way of putting it. Though now, I think I was the one largely at fault for that. Hizashi murmured. Masaru hummed. Well, Masaru said, the reason I brought it up is because I think, personally, that Inka would have wanted you to stay with Izuku. She didn't know a lot of what you two know now, Masaru, Hizashi pointed out softly. I know, but you were alone for so long. You're basically new at this whole family thing, much less parenting, and you're... Retiring, Hizashi. 
I don't know much about villains, much less supervillains, but I think that says a lot about how much you care. Hizashi looked away. Even if she knew what we do now, if she knew she couldn't be here, I think she would rather her baby stay with you. You're Izuku's dad, Hizashi. And I know, and Mitsuki knows, and I'm willing to bet your brother would know that you care so much about Izuku. So don't beat yourself up so much over something that didn't even happen, okay? Hizashi sighed, closing his eyes. Something wet leaked out beneath his lashes. He rubbed at his eyes roughly. Thank you, Masaru. After the Bakugos left, Hizashi slowly made his way back to his... the... his chair, next to Izuku. His heart thudded in his chest with every step he took, his hands clenched into fists to keep them steady. He was scared. Terrified, actually. But as he sat, as the vinyl creaked, no alarms went off. Izuku just kept sleeping, his little belly swollen and his little hands hanging over the edge of his supportive pillows. Izashi stared at his son. Watching his chest rise and fall, something heavy settled on his heart. Something like relief. Something like responsibility. Something like grief, like fear, like determination. His hands were dirty. His hands were bloody. His hands were deadly. But to Izuku, his hands were clean. For Izuku, his hands were gentle. He hesitated. He touched the incubator porthole. He pulled his hand away, fingers curling uncertainly. He reached out again. He hesitated again. He pulled it open and put his hand in. Izashi held his breath as he, as he carefully, as he possibly could, pushed his finger into Izuku's hand. The moment Izuku's fingers curled around his, he finally felt like he could breathe again after a day of absolute hell. Izuku's grip was weak. His touch, feather light. His fingers uncurled a moment later, and Izashi pulled his hand out, closing the incubator back up so Izuku could stay warm. Izashi stared at his finger. He could still feel the ghost of Izuku's touch. He curled his hands into a fist and crossed his arms and let his head rest as close to the incubator as possible. He wasn't entirely sure what Yuichi would think of all this. The things the Bakugos had said, the decisions he'd made, the fact that this was happening at all. While he was certain Yoichi would agree that a child deserved to have their only living parent stay with him, he wasn't sure if that still applied if the parent was him. How would Yoichi have possibly squared that away, with his strong sense of justice, especially considering all the people he had hurt? While it was fair to Izuku, it wasn't fair to them. Hizashi had no idea what Yoichi would say the right thing was. He certainly had no clue, not when his only idea had been shot down as cheap cowardice. He supposed it didn't matter in the end. He would simply do his best to stay with Izuku, do his best by Izuku, and hope that that was enough. All right, listeners, this concludes Day 38 of All For You. Day 39 will be next. Hope you all are still enjoying, and as always, thank you so much for listening.